live stream is about long form content, it's about interactive content, content that you can actually talk to your viewers about or talk to other streamers about. It's about creating these jobs for people that might not enjoy working at a white car job or like driving Ubers or something. They, they just really enjoy playing video games. Why not make a career of playing video games and being able to connect with other people all around the country to watch these video games and having a thriving career that way? I, I think that's awesome. Welcome to the Hacker Noob Podcast. I'm your host, Trent Lipinski. In this episode, I interview Peter Yang. He's a senior product manager over at Twitch, which is owned by Amazon and is the largest live streaming video platform on the internet. They primarily focus on gaming, and in this episode, Peter and I discuss what's happening in the U.S. market versus the Chinese market. We also dive into his product management experience at Periscope and Facebook as well, and the differences between Facebook, Periscope, and Twitch. This is an amazing episode, so stay tuned. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. From predictable pricing to flexible configurations to world-class customer support, you'll get access to all the infrastructure services you need to grow. Plus, DigitalOcean's community provides over 2,000 cloud-agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open-source software, languages, and frameworks. Get started on DigitalOcean with a free $100 credit at do.co slash hackernoon. Welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Peter Yang. He's a product manager over at Twitch. Tell us a bit about who you are and what you're working on. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be here uh, at Twitch. I work on the creator experience team. Our, our goal is to basically help our broadcasters kind of grow on our platform. Um, and I've been working in the live streaming space for the past couple of years. I worked at uh, Periscope and also on Facebook Live as, as well. And I think what really uh, interests me about this space is uh, not so much the video aspect, it's more about the fact that there's this whole field of people who are basically making a live living, like streaming streaming from their living room or streaming, mm-hmm. streaming games, streaming all kinds of stuff, right? So it's like really fascinating. And I'm also, I also think live streaming is really interesting because it's more about the community, the conversations that happen than the video content itself. So, yeah. yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about like these live streamers that are like making ridiculous amounts of money, essentially just playing video games? Yeah. So for example, on, on Twitch, there, there's, um, you know, a, a million plus streamers, right? And, and mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, it, it's actually a very hard job because you have to stream like five or six hours a day. You have to stream uh, at a consistent schedule every, every single week so that viewers know when to come back and when to watch you, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the reason that game streaming has taken off is because it's, it's very hard to be entertaining yourself for like five or six hours a day, <laughs> right? You can make all kinds of faces, but it's, it's very hard to be entertaining. So it's, it's much easier to be entertaining by like streaming a game, playing a game that has like a storyline and a lot of nice graphics, and then being able to kind of engage with your viewers through that, right? Like mm-hmm. that, that is much more that allows you to much more have a kind of long form content and long form streaming basis. Yeah. And I mean, when I was a kid, like I would go over to my friends' houses and I would watch them play video games. Like a lot of those games are single player and like yeah. that's what we did. Like there would be groups of four or five of us and we would like sometimes we would switch off. Sometimes it was just one person who had the controller and the yeah. rest of us would just watch. Um I mean as early back as like N sixty four and like Zelda days. Uh, yeah. you know, so This isn't that new. The only thing that's new is the fact that we get to share it now over the internet with possibly thousands of people at the same time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Think about it as just like thousands of people in your living room watching you play a game, right? And kind of interacting Mm -hmm. with you. So, so yeah. And like right now, I mean, the most popular gamer, it it seems to be Fortnite at the moment. Yeah. Um, So, you know, there's been a, I've heard stories of like uh, Ninja. He's one of the, uh, you know, one of the top Fortnite streamers. I mean, he was, I think he was pulling in something like $50,000 a month uh, yeah. just through, I, I'm guessing that's through donations or do you guys have a payment platform? How does that work? Uh, so uh, we have a few different ways for streamers to make money. And mm-hmm. you're, you're right, Ninja's making a lot of money. So I think a primary way that we help streamers make money is like through subscriptions. And subscriptions are very nice because you know, as a viewer, I can subscribe to, to your stream 
for like four nine nine or something to show my support. And subscriptions are kind of a recurring revenue stream, right? So a streamer can count on it every, every single month to make a living. Um, we also provide like bits and donations, which is more around like virtual goods. So people like splash these bits on, on the screen to like get the streamer's attention or when something crazy ha ha happens. And you know, bits and donations kind of like come and go depending on how entertaining your stream is. Um, and then there's also like advertising, sponsorships, um, you know, they can just making clothes and stuff as, as far as I know, like just a whole bunch of different ways to actually uh, monetize, right? So it's yeah. just crazy to me. I mean, it's, I went into the wrong profession. Like I feel like I should have kept playing video games more. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I, I couldn't imagine when I was a kid having the technology to be able to do this um, because like now that it's here and it's happening, I mean, this is, this is kind of creating a new economy. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I yeah, when, when I was a kid, I, I felt bad for playing video games. So right? I felt like I was not doing my homework, you know, <laughs> I was like, I'm not really wasting my time I'm here, but I actually can make a, a lot of money, money from just playing video, video games and being entertaining. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and I've, I've had that conversation with like my, my uncle about my nephews and like, it's like all these kids want to do is play video games. And I'm like, yeah, let them. Um, cause like what I realized as I got older, like from some, like watching my friends play games and stuff, like they actually learned some valuable social skills playing, you know, world of Warcraft and some of these games. I mean, I had some friends that like, you know, I didn't hear from them for a couple of years because they were playing like WoW, for example. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, and you know, there were definitely there were definitely those people that got sucked into it. But on the other end, there was definitely the ones that like I feel like they really benefited from having that community and that support, and yeah. they made some real friendships playing those games. Totally, yeah. I mean, I I, th I think it's kind of like any other uh, it's kind of like any other drug. It depends on like, if you have like addictive personality. Yeah. Like, yeah. like when I was playing WoW back in college, I, I definitely got addicted and it definitely negatively affected my real life relationships. But some people can just like, you know, check in and check out. And, you know, some people like meet their spouse on, on, on WoW, right? And, and they actually get married. So, yeah. And I mean, now you, can, now you can live stream it. And so what, you know, you've worked for Facebook, you've worked for Periscope, you've now, you're now with Twitch. So like you've kind of seen the whole spectrum of, you know, working at all these different live video companies. Yeah. Like what are, what were some of the different experiences you've had, you know, between working on those different companies versus, you know, where you're at now with Twitch? So I think there's, you know, there's a few different live video formats that uh, there's a few different use cases that work really well with live video, right? So we talk about the video game use case. Uh, when I was working at Facebook and Periscope, another use case that works very well, it doesn't happen very often, is just like breaking news events. If something crazy is going on in, in the world, you want to stream in, people are going to tune in to watch, right? Uh, a final use case is like IRL, so like in real live streams. Um, for example, when I was working on Periscope, um, we saw a lot of popular streams around religious content. So there were these like people um, running Sunday ser sermons and, you know, mm -hmm. basically going to church through live stream. And they developed these like really awesome communities, right? Like another really amazing uh, community on Periscope is around pot pot pottery. So a lot of people like to make pots and they kind of like meet each other through the, this app and like there's like this whole like pot, pottery making, pottery watching com community. Um, the, the cases where I think live stream do not work as well are um, like going live with your friends. Like if, if you're like out there with your friends hang, hanging out and you start live streaming, it's like a very awkward situation for, for your friends, right? Like they don't, they don't necessarily want to be in live stream. So I, I, I found it kind of, uh, I found it kind of crazy that Facebook put like a massive, advertising campaign around going out with friends because I don't think it's like a really well supported use case. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think now they're, they're working on like, you know, video games and other more suitable use cases around live streaming. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. From predictable pricing to flexible configurations to world-class customer support, you'll get access to all the infrastructure services you need to grow. Plus, DigitalOcean's community provides over 2,000 cloud-agnostic tutorials to help you stay up-to-date with the latest open-source software, languages, and frameworks. Get started on DigitalOcean with a free $100 credit at do.co slash hackernoon. And I, I remember back like in the early days. So, you know, I worked with a company that was trying to work on a live video solution, like in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. Yeah. And, like, you know, it was a totally different world because we didn't have the smartphone yet. So, you know, there was no iPhone, there was no Android. 
Um, it was just, it was totally different. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, like, you know, that's where Justin and like I Justine and like, that's where this kind of started. They used to use like laptops uh, and like the wireless cards plugged into laptops to be able to live stream their lives. I mean, that was kind of the initial, like, that was how this whole thing kind of kicked off. And I mean, that was, that was 10, 11 years ago now. Yeah. I mean, even to this day, like the majority of Twitch streamers are like on the computer. They actually have like multiple monitor set up so they can monitor everything while, while they're streaming. Mm -hmm. I, I think like the mobile streaming use case hasn't really taken off too much in the US. It's taking off in like other markets like China, but not so much here, you know? So. Yeah, and what it, so what are the differences you're seeing between like the different markets like the US and China? I feel like uh, China uh, is just kind of like a parallel universe for tech. <laughs> uh, there's like uh, different, it's the same type of companies in China that do the same things in the US, but because, because it's hard for US companies to expand in China, because it's hard for Chinese companies to expand here. It's like, it's like a parallel universe, right? And, and like for live streaming, I think the difference is that in the US, um, I think video game streaming is very popular, much more popular than like uh, IRL streaming. In China, I think video game streaming is still very popular, but there's this like massive uh, IRL market, market of people streaming, usually like um, young, like teenage guys and, and girls streaming themselves, like dancing, singing, and mm -hmm. uh, entertaining people who are in this like, second or third tier cities who are not close to your family or friends. So it's, it's, it's very interesting uh, dy dy dynamic. Yeah. So it's almost, so there's like almost a different social dynamic in China versus the United States. I think so. I think people, uh, you know, people watch like Twitch or something to be entertained, to maybe like send, send some memes and, and, you know, have fun. Right. But I think people in China, there's like, um, there's this real sense of loneliness where you're, you're working in like a second or third tier city. You're not making a lot of money. You don't have a lot of friends. So you really kind of use these streaming apps to um, get some sort of recognition or get some, some awareness from mm -hmm. these like good looking streamers. And, and then you kind of show them your support. It, it's a much more, I would say, um, focus on like curing loneliness than people here. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't watch Twitch. I don't watch someone playing Fortnite to cure my loneliness. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's more of an entertainment. But I do think there is like a, I don't know, a friendship aspect to it. Yes. Uh, where the live streamers almost start to kind of feel like you do have some kind of personal relationship with them. Yeah, um, I mean. And you're interacting yeah. with them. Yeah, you're definitely interacting with them. And if you look at the apps in China, it's also, uh, it feels a lot more like you're paying for friendship because like the, the apps are much more transactional. Like virtual goods is a much more prevalent model in China than like subscriptions or these other revenue sources. And just a constant stream of just like sports cars, like flowers and stuff flashing on the screen. And the streamer is not even shy to like ask for stuff, right? It's like, give me stuff so, so I can, you know, continue to do well in my career, right? So. Yeah. And so uh, since you've been with Twitch, was that previous to the Amazon acquisition or? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's a, a, after the Amazon. Okay, yeah. so, you, so you joined after they, they joined Amazon, okay. Yeah. So, and, so what's, uh, so you so you saw all these different use cases, right, between Facebook and Periscope, like what, and now you're seeing the differences between like uh, the Asian market versus the US market. What's kind of next for live streaming? Um, what's next for live streaming? I, I think there's still a ton of room to grow in the uh, gaming space, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, Twitch is gonna go deep into gaming, but also start to expand into kind of these adjacent verticals. So for example, we recently announced like Twitch Sings, which is like a karaoke thing. <laughs> it's kind of, and, and we're, we're, we're like um, streaming shows like Pokemon and like, you know, mm -hmm. um, all, all, all kinds of shows that people who watch video games also like to watch, right? So, so, so I think there's a lot of room to expand to different verticals in the US market. In, in China, I, I feel like live streaming has almost like reached its peak to a certain extent. And mm -hmm. it's slowly kind of uh, being cannibalized or replaced by some of these other video apps. So just like, for example, uh, a lot of people are watching just like short video apps now instead of like live streaming because it's kind of like more bite-sized consumption when you're on a go. Like Snapchat yeah. and Facebook stories and that. Yeah, kind it's of kind of similar to do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, because you can watch it, you know, you don't have to be live. Uh, you can watch them pre-recorded. So there's, you know, I could see something there. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then, you know, you have, 
YouTube Live. And like, I've never, I, I feel like YouTube Live never really fully took off compared to like Periscope and Facebook Live. And, you know, obviously Twitch dominates this space. Um, I, I'm, any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I don't really know what's going on with YouTube Live. I just know that um, being like the number one video site, right? They, they probably have a whole bunch of competing pri pri priorities. Yeah, uh, they probably cannot go full in on the live streaming uh, people because they also have to satisfy like the people who upload videos and you yeah. know all their media partners, right? So yeah. yeah, and you know, really, what it gets down to is you're you're a product manager. So can you talk a little bit like what is your day to day look like? And you know, with all the experience you have working in all these major tech companies, what does yeah. that look like for the you know? Kind of explain that to the average listener. Sure. So I, I think what a product manager does is uh, a product manager is basically at the end of the day, a product manager needs to ship good products uh, that customers actually want, that actually solves real customer problems, right? And, and the way that a product manager does that is um, he or she should like enable like the rest of the team from the en engineers to the designers to the other teams uh, by being like an awesome communicator. Uh, by keeping everyone on, on track and like um, trying to resolve conflicts and you know uh, figure out dependencies, so you can sh actually ship a really good product at, at a reasonable amount of time, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I see a product manager as kind of like a enabler of other other people on on the team. And what are some of like the skills that you've had to harness to become a good product manager? <laughs> Uh, so I I would say I'm definitely not like you know like like a chief product officer or anything. I'm, I'm still like working on my skills. But I think a few things that I've learned is that uh, number one, you need to be you need to be like um, you need to have a humble attitude. You're not like people say that product managers are like CEO of the product. If if you really think that way, then you're probably not gonna be set up for success because you need to have a humble enough attitude to be like, hey, like this designer or this engineer or this other PM could actually have a better idea to help improve my product than myself. So my job is actually just to pull the best ideas out of other people. Right, and, and try to find the truth of other people instead of like being right or have the best ideas all the time. Right, so that, that's something that I, I feel like new product managers struggle with because they want to have the perfect spec or they want to have the perfect uh, presentation. But in reality, the earlier you can share your stuff with other people and the earlier you can kind of pull in the best ideas for yourself, the better off you'll be. Right, um, I think another important thing for product managers is that um, you really have to, uh, like, no, no matter what goes wrong. Uh, it's, it's always your fault. So you really have to take on, you really have to take ownership of the situation. Uh, if if something happens and you start blaming your engineers or start blaming like someone else, um, then you're not gonna, gonna be a good product manager. You just have to like accept responsibility because uh, because you know at the end of the day you're in charge of shipping a good product, right? So if something goes wrong, then you should like really internalize and figure out why. Uh, and I think the the uh, the third thing I think learned working at Twitch and Amazon is you really have to obsess over the customer problem. Like I, I feel like, you know, every, every, every product manager talks about starting from the customer problem, but in reality, uh, a lot of PMs just like make up what the customer problem is or they don't, they don't do their home, homework mm -hmm. and they end up building a product that, that does not solve a real problem. And, and, and that is a really bad thing, right? So you really have to really do the homework, look at the numbers, talk to customers all, all the time and, and kind of really obsess over the customer problem. Yeah. And is it like, how do you determine what is a good feature or what is a good product or is it intuition? Is it, yeah. uh, is it, you know, is it data? Are you just, is this just hard numbers for you or yeah. is this something where, you know, you have to internalize it and really like put yourself in the customer's shoes? I, I think it's re you really have to consider multiple sources of information and, mm -hmm. and try to make the best decision based on the sources, right? So one source is talking to customers directly, trying to understand their pain pain points, and trying to understand that this is like a pain point that's shared by the majority of our customers, right? The second thing is definitely looking at the numbers, seeing where people are dropping off in the front funnel, uh, seeing where you can optimize to help to help your product grow, and, and the third thing, like I mentioned, is actually just like talking to people on your team, talking to like people who are working in support or working in partnerships or working in sales who are close to the customer to get an idea of what they think, right? So you have to mesh the three things together and figure out what the best path forward is. And eventually does it just kind of become like you just start to pick up on some of this stuff or like what, 
what what makes a product good? Uh, I think what makes a product good is it, it solves it needs to solve a customer problem, mm-hmm. and I feel like the simpler the product is and the simpler the customer problem it solves is, uh, the better it is. You know, like it's it's very easy for a product to become very complicated, and then uh, you end up in a situation where you just keep building and building and never never ship, or you you want to ship fast. And you just like ship a subpar product. You, you say it's like an experiment. I'm, I'm testing something. But in reality, it's like actually really bad for the customer experience, right? So you always need to balance between shipping a quality product and, and getting, getting your product out to the market as quickly as possible. Um, so this whole concept of like a minimal viable product, like now there's this whole movement around like a minimal lovable pro- pro- product. <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of corny, but I, I, I do believe that you have to ship like a minimal lovable product, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it also matters if you're at a startup versus, uh, you know, a larger corporation. Because mm-hmm. if you're a larger corporation and you've got the resources and you've got the team and you have, you know, the time potentially to put into the product, yeah. that's a different equation versus, you know, a startup that, you know, if they don't get something to the market quickly and start iterating quickly, then, sure. you know, they're going to run out of money um, sure. and time. So um, I can definitely see the arguments for both sides and the differences between corporate versus startup. That's a really good point. Yeah, I don't have a ton of startup experience, so I've always worked at these like larger companies. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good point, yeah. And, you know, what, you know, having worked at all these larger companies, like, you know, where, where do you see these companies kind of going in the future? Because there's been a lot of strife, especially lately with like Facebook and, you know, they've had data scandals and all that kind of stuff. Periscope, I haven't seen too much, but I yeah. know Twitter, uh, you know, they're constantly in the headlines. Um, Twitch, we don't, doesn't really make headlines too often, but, uh, you know, what, what's kind of your sense on what's happening in Silicon Valley right now? Um, I think, uh, I feel like the larger companies have more power than ever before, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you look at Google, Facebook, and Amazon, and, you know, Microsoft, these other companies, they're basically competing on all fronts. It used to be like Amazon's focused on shopping, you know, Facebook's focused on social, and then Google's focused on search. But now, you know, all three companies have uh, shopping, uh, search, ads. They're competing on like basically all fronts, right? So it's kind of interesting. In some ways, I kind of feel it's bad because it's stifling the entrepreneurial spirit a little bit. It's kind of like stifling. Like if if I want to start like a video startup right now, it's probably not a very good idea, right? (laughs) Especially in the U.S. market. So I I feel like in some ways it's bad. But in other ways, uh, I feel like these companies have so much power that it's natural that they just want to expand to all different spaces, right, and compete. So and I think I saw recently that BitChute, um, they're like a competing decentralized video platform. I think they just got banned on PayPal or something like that. Oh, yeah. Um, so, like, there's, there's some weird backlash that's happened. We've also seen, like, uh, Gab, they were or like a Twitter alternative. Uh, they yeah. were also banned from, uh, from payment platforms and um, it's like, it's to the point now where like, if you try to compete with some of these companies, uh, yeah. the banks will literally shut down your access to be able to use money. Um, wow. Wow. and it's, it's kind of a weird, it's a weird time. Uh, you know, and you know, I just wanted to get your perspective because you know, you've been, you've been working for these large corporations for most of your career. Yeah. I mean, let's take Facebook as an example, right? I, I, I think, uh, Facebook is still the most well-run company I've ever worked at. They're like super efficient. They're mm-hmm. very metrics fo- focused. Uh, I feel like um, the challenge there is like being a very metrics focused and being so focused on growth, uh, you kind of lose sight of some of these other uh, so so societal issues, right? And, until they kind of like come back and bite you. So now they're trying to play and catch, catch up there. Um, you know, trade-offs that you can make that will grow a num- number uh, might actually be really bad for like sentiment or like trust. And those things are much harder to measure than like your quality metric goal, right? Yeah. So you kind of have to, you know, I, I feel like Facebook has a ton of PMs. Each PM is focused on one, one thing and they're really focused on op- optimizing their metric. So it's kind of up to your leadership to take a step back and understand if growing these numbers or growing this metric is actually good for the company, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so how do you manage that personally when you feel like there's, you know, a metric issue versus is this the right direction to go down? So if there's a disconnect between what, uh, you know, customers are saying, like what streamers are saying, 
versus what the numbers are saying, uh, I tend to always lean on the side of the stream streamers, mm-hmm. of, of the customers. Now, if, if you work at a, I mean, depends on the PM role too, right? So like my, my role is very much uh, working with the creators, trying to understand their needs and trying to build products to meet these needs, right? But if, if you're like a growth PM and you're in charge of just like optimizing the onboarding funnel uh, for like Facebook, you, you can't go off and talk to like five random customers because they have like a billion customers, right? So you probably put a lot more emphasis on the numbers. But even putting emphasis on numbers, you should still check, do a gut check with a few customers to see if this is actually a good experience or not, right? Yeah. Awesome. And what is some time in your life that you've had to hack something? Uh, so I, I worked on this hackathon project at Facebook that I'm pretty proud of. Uh, we were working on um, the, the, the use cases like, you know, when you're watching uh, sports, when you're watching a game, you, you kind of want to see the live scores. You want to see the live chatter about the game, about like amazing plays and so on, right? So just kind of like a uh, water cooler around the game. Mm-hmm. And we built this like really basic product that shows you, you go to this page, uh, if you're watching like a basketball game, you can see the scores update in real time. You can see the major plays, like who scored a basket and so on. And you can also see like public chatter about the game. Uh, and it's, it's, it's like a really uh, awesome second screen experience. If you're watching a game on TV, you can see how people are reacting to a game on, on your phone. Yeah. I've done that myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you built, so you actually hacked a user interface for this together. What, what was the, the product you created around this? Uh, I, I think it's probably still around. I, I think it's called Facebook sports stadium. I was only there at the very beginning. It started as a kind of a hackathon project. Um, and then I, I think we kind of like built it from there because you know, people don't really watch a lot of media live anymore, but like sports is one thing that is still best consumed live. And, and, and like, you know, being able to kind of watch it together with uh, other people on Facebook or your friends, I believe is still like a very valid use case. Yeah. And I've, I've seen that where like there's a sports game being broadcast and there's like a little chat room next to it yeah. Uh, yeah. and everyone's kind of interacting. And uh, there's a couple, I've seen that on a couple different sites. Um, and uh, so what, uh, what are kind of your final thoughts on, you know, what's happening with the streaming space and, you know, kind of what we've talked about so far? Um, you know, I, I think what gets me out of bed every day is, um, you know, streaming, like live streaming is about uh, long form content, right? Long form and uh, is about interactive content, content that you can actually uh, talk to your viewers about or talk to other streamers about. And, you know, it's, it's about creating these jobs for people that uh, might not enjoy working, at, you know, at a white car job or like, uh, driving Ubers or something, mm-hmm. they, they just really enjoy playing video games, right? And you, 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 I know this. Like playing video games is fun. So why not make a career of playing video games and being able to connect with other people uh, in you know all around the country to watch these video games, and and you know ha- having a thriving career that way. Like I, I think that's awesome. You know. And do you have some numbers just to like put this in perspective for the audience? Like, is is there some metrics or something that you can just provide? Because from what I understand, like you know, e-gaming, e-sports, like it's, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, yeah. How many people are actually watching this stuff on like a daily basis? Uh, I do not know the numbers offhand, but I believe that, you know, there's definitely millions of broadcasters and even more viewers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the, the majority of the broadcasters uh, are, you know, have a very small viewer base. It's, it's kind of like any other content platform, right? Like there's a few stars and there's a majority of trying to kind of grow into stars. So, and if, if you, sorry, this doesn't really answer your question, but if you go into a, um, a stream that only has a, a few, like 10 viewers, 20 viewers, it's very different from going to a ninja stream, right? Mm-hmm. If you go to a ninja stream, it's like all kinds of like stuff flying around. <laughs> the yeah. chat is like going crazy. And you know, it's, it's kind of fun that way. But I actually prefer to go to small streamer channels because then you can really make a connection mm-hmm. with the streamer and you can actually have a conversation. Right. Uh, that to me feels much more like a kind of like close, like talking to a friend than going to like a huge streamer channel. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And no worries. You know, I was just trying to put in perspective, you know, this is, this really is something for the, you know, that the next generation really, there's a lot of focus and attention and eyeballs and users. I mean, it's massive yeah. uh, scale of, you know, what, what's happening on Twitch and these streaming sites is just insane. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do have some numbers from China, which I, I think, you know, is, is just on an order of magnitude level higher than, than here, I would say. Like, for example, there's like 300 million people in China who watch live streams, right? And, and it's like a $5 billion market. Yeah. It's a huge, huge market. You know, 300 million people is like the entire population of the U.S., right? So mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. Yeah. That's crazy. So the, basically the population of the U.S. in China watches live streaming. Yes. That's amazing. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter. I also write these blog posts on Medium. Uh, you can find me at Peter G. Yang. So awesome. just like search it out on Twitter. And, you'll and we got to get you uh, writing on Hacker Noon as well. I do write on Hack New. Okay, okay, good. Keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. So, awesome. Thank you for coming on the show. Cool, Trent. Thanks. This concludes another episode of the Hacker Noon podcast. I'm your host, Trent Lipinski. Please don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes and YouTube and follow us on social media. You can also find us at hackernoon.com and podcast.hackernoon.com for more episodes. Thank you for listening.